Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, three things really. Um, enhancements I've made to the plugin manager, uh, the work I've been doing of MQTT, which I uh, spent some time talking with uh, Herb Garcia here in um, uh, Minneapolis about uh, with respect to IoT devices. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about getting the data out of Cassandra and doing data science on that data that's in Cassandra. So uh, let me start first of all by talking about the plugin manager. Um, so um, many of you are aware, of you are aware that, that there is a plugin manager in OpenNMS and it isn't really very widely used at the moment, has to be said, but it's there. And um, I've been using it, so I've been gradually getting more ideas about things it can be used for and ways it can be improved. And uh, it is effectively a standalone library. Uh, which allows you to uh, manage plugins in any craft container. Uh, it can manage plugins in, in OpenNMS, obviously, but it could also be managing uh, features that are running up or running down in any remote craft, which could include a minion if you wanted to run it there as well. So I can't show you the... the I've made some minor changes to the UI, uh, but uh, this is the old UI. I can't show you the other stuff I'm going to show you with the the new OpenNMS at this point. So I'm, I'm just going to talk to some of the changes in the plugin manager before I go on to um, uh, talk about anything else. So basically, to, to recap, the idea of the plugin manager is that um, a particular uh, OpenNMS has a number of plugins that are installed and it has a number of available plugins. So I can choose a plugin and say, I want to install it, and I can install it. But I can also add that selected plugin to something called the plugin manifest. So then if I look at the manifest, you can see that that plugin is added to the manifest. Now, the big change that I've made to uh, the plugin manager this time around is that what the manifest represents is a list of features that you want to run in a particular carafe. And I've created the ability for remote carafes to ask the plugin manager what features they should be running, and then the plugin manager sends them back a feature uh, description based on the um, uh, plugins that are actually uh, put into the manifest here. So you can specify specifically for any uh, remote device what features you want to run in that device. And the device, when it starts up, will look and see if it has a local manifest telling you what it should do, and if it does, it will run that. But periodically, or on startup, it can go off and ask, is there anything else I should be doing? And it will download a manifest, which effectively would come from this list. Now, everything that you see in the UI here is also available through a REST interface. So this can form the basis of a way of programming remote devices to do what you want them to do. And the devices, when they ask for their manifest, they give their ID so that the manifest that comes back is specific to the ID of the remote device. So this was important for the IoT work that I was doing because these remote devices are going to be IoT devices. And we needed a way to control the software that ran on those devices. And this provides a mechanism for doing that, even though the device is running behind a firewall because the device asks for what should I do rather than... Um, just having to be told, although you can tell it directly as well. Now, the other thing that the plugin manager allows you to do is to create a license which allows a remote plugin to run. Um, and basically, it uses public and private key encryption. And what you do is you, when you, um, uh, I'm not sure I have any licenses actually installed um, here to show you, so it doesn't really matter. But basically, when you, when you put in your license string, your license string has as part of it uh, metadata that describes the license itself. So it tells you the start time and the end time or the duration of the license, tells you what the license will run. So it gives you an association to the plugin that will only run with that license is verified. And it gives you uh, extra metadata in the form of options that say, um, you know, this license allows you to run this feature or this feature or this feature as, as part of that license. So that is all within the publicly visible metadata. Now, that's all well and good, but it turns out that there's also a need to have encrypted metadata that could also be supplied with the license. So the thing that I've added into the plugin manager is the ability of when you create a license, 
You can give it the public information, which will be available even if the license isn't verified. But you can also um, give it private information, which is only available when the license is decrypted. So if the license can be decrypted by the license authenticator, which is part of the system and the remote device, then the remote device will also get this extra secret metadata that's been delivered with the license. Now, the use case for this is to be able to give the remote device passwords and keys so it can talk to whatever it needs to talk to. So whenever an end user sets up a device, they can they install their license in the device that allows the device to run. But as part of installing that, device, that license, the license, which is individually keyed to that user, can also contain the username and password that will allow that remote thing to talk to the MQTT broker or whatever else it needs to talk to to do its job. So there can be secret information in the license now that can be used uh, to, to allow this remote device to do something, but which is not publicly available or visible to anybody else. So that, that really is what I've been doing with the, the license manager. But I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about MQTT and the MQTT plugin which is work that I've done previously, um, but um, I haven't really introduced it properly. So this was done in parallel with the work that's been done on Drift. So there's, there's definitely ways in which this can be integrated with Drift, but it kind of does some of the Drift stuff anyway. And it is itself a plugin. So basically to install this, you install a car file in the deploy directory of OpenNMS and the whole thing will come up and run. And you just need to put an XML file uh, in the uh, etc. directory to give it its configuration. And basically, the way this works is it's a, a plugin to allow OpenNMS to register itself with an MQTT broker. And in the, the demo, basically, the MQTT broker is ActiveMQ, but it can be any broker that supports the MQTT protocol. So you'd have many sensors out in the world you're talking via LoRaWAN or whatever, to the MQTT broker. And then OpenNMS acts as a client to that broker and it will register on the topics that the broker is supporting. So the information comes in from the sensors. The sensors speak to whatever topic. It comes in and OpenNMS will then, having registered with that broker, receive those messages. Now, the, the problem is that... Um, MQTT defines uh, a, a way of giving a message a topic, a quality of uh, service, uh, but then it just defines a load of bytes. Uh, it doesn't actually tell you what needs to be in the payload of the MQTT message. And every IoT device seems to have a different payload. So what we need to be able to do is to decode the payload based on what's likely to be there. And it turns out that uh, it could be JSON, it can be XML, it can, and it can be protobuf or any number of other things that could fit within the payload of the MQTT message. And so what I've done is written a decoder based upon the work that Alejandro had done for decoding uh, JSON and XML, but actually it will work with any Java object that uses JX path. So essentially you define a JX path definition that says, when I receive this MQTT message, this is how I'm going to decode it. And then you can take that message and turn it into either or both an OpenNMS event, in which case the payload of the message goes in as var binds within the event, or as data within OpenNMS, in which case it gets post posted into Cassandra or into RRDs. And so what I've defined is a way in which you can define the uh, actual parsing of the event as it comes in into the data that's going to go into the RRDs. We can see here an example of the uh, configuration. <coughs> so essentially what I'm saying is I'm going to subscribe to this topic, which just happens to be called MQTT data. I could have multiple topics I'm subscribing to. But whenever data comes in from those topics, then it will be passed on to this XML group which uh, basically follows exactly the same pattern as Alejandro's previous work. Uh, it picks up the data from the JSON and it pushes it out into whatever fields in OpenNMS it needs to go, saying it's a string or a gauge. Now, the time field is the important one because that's the one that actually gets used to give the timestamp to the data. 
Um, and the other important one is uh, the ID, which is used to uh, create the foreign ID within the OpenNMS uh, um, uh, node. So if a message comes in which OpenNMS knows nothing about, then it can create a node at that point for receiving any more messages from that particular node. So OpenNMS doesn't need to know what nodes it's going to receive messages from, provided the payload gives you the identifier of the node whenever the message first arrives. So that's for data, and it's exactly the same for events. You can take the, the information, and in this case, instead of being pushed into uh, um, uh, data groups, it'll be pushed into varbind. So each of these fields will become a varbind field within an event. But the node that that event is associated with will be the node of, with the same ID as you have here. It can also do stuff like, for instance, latitude and longitude can be pushed into the asset directory if that's supplied with the message. So again, if a node shows up, it'll show up in the right place on the map because the latitude and longitude have been given in the, the message, things like that. So that, that just gives you a broader brush of, of how this works in terms of getting data into OpenNMS from an MQTT device. So that's there, that works. The next question is, fine, we've got the data into OpenNMS, what can we do with it? Well, it turns out that there are many, many, many different use cases for MQTT data, many more than OpenNMS itself could handle. And quite often the requirement is to take that data and perform data science on it, which is basically doing a lot of statistics and machine learning and different things. And depending on the use case, the data scientist may use a different algorithm each time. So it's not something that OpenNMS does natively um, by itself. It may do some of that, but really what we want to do is make it possible for tools uh, or libraries that data scientists use for analyzing this data to be able to access the Cassandra database and get the data out and do something useful with it. So that's the next thing I wanted to talk about. So the data has been posted into Cassandra. And uh, so what I have is uh, a typical tool. Uh, this is called Rapid Miner. It's an open source tool. Uh, uh, if you want the, the clever version, you have to pay for it. But um, you know, side of the box, you can get something that's quite good. Um, it will connect directly to Cassandra or to any database or to a spreadsheet or to any pretty much any data source you could imagine. And you can see here that it defines various boxes, but what in fact it's defining is processes. And processes can feed from one process to another process to another process. And so these two processes here are very simple. They're just reading data in. I haven't got anything here yet to do something clever with that data. But if I wanted to do something clever, I could, for instance, use uh, one of the predictive modeling processes where it'll apply Bayesian modeling or it'll provide you do neural networks or whatever. So all of this stuff is defined within the tool. All it needs is the data to actually do the work and somebody who's clever enough to know what these things actually mean and configure them to do it. But it's a workbench. That's what it's designed to be. So how do we get the data out of Cassandra and out of OpenNMS into the tool? Well, it's very simple to do the database. Basically, uh, you, you attach to a Postgres database just using the standard stuff, and you build an SQL query. In this case, all I'm doing is select foreign source, foreign ID from node. So not very clever, but it basically shows you can get any data you want out of the SQL database to push into this tool. And then you could munge that with other data to, to do what you need to do. So for instance, you might say, give me all the nodes with a certain foreign ID or with a certain foreign ID or with a certain category or whatever, and that would narrow down the search. The clever thing is, what do we do with Cassandra? Well, the problem with Cassandra, or more more appropriately, the problem with Newt's, which is OpenNMS's use of Cassandra, is that Newt's doesn't save the data in any usable form that any of these tools can recognize out of the box, because it saves the values, the times, the time, uh, the um, uh, data values as uh, blob objects, basically which correspond to particular objects within OpenNMS. So we have to do something with that to turn it into something that the tool can use. And to do that, it, relatively simple in fact, all you do is you add in, um, let me see if I can get it. Uh, yeah, you add in uh, a couple of simple functions, which are, are user-defined functions 
within the Cassandra database. Now, this doesn't show up very well, obviously, but I can go into it in more detail later. But basically what it's doing is it's defining a Java function, which is saying, what is this value number? So it, it looks and says, okay, is this value number a counter or an absolute or a gauge? And it looks at the bytes within the blob to determine that. And having determined if it's a counter, uh, uh, an absolute or a gauge, then it decodes it in the appropriate way. And this just is a simple function that you push into Cassandra. So now when you get the data out, you can get it out in a form that the tool can use. So I've pushed these two uh, simple uh, um, uh, user-defined functions into Cassandra already. And if I then run the uh, demo, in this case, the read Cassandra, if I look at the thing, all I'm doing is uh, a simple CQL query using collected at resource metric name. But here is the actual function using the met newt's type value and using the newt's value number value functions from samples. So I apply that and then I run it. What we'll see is the database runs and the other one. So the database, very simple, just comes out with normal tabular data. But what comes out with the Cassandra is the metric name, the resource name, and the uh, nudes type as a string in this case, and then the actual value. And we can see that I've had a simulator running for a while. Um, see for instance, these values here, PM1, PM2, these are simulated values from the MQTT device, and it's come out as a gauge and is gone as a nudes value of minus 0.846 or whatever. So it means the data is now available to be able to uh, be uh, manipulated by the rest of the tool. Sorry, Taurus. Do we actually misspell the word gauge in newts, or is that a mapping in this tool? I think you possibly misspelled it in newts. That's the same mapping in newts itself. Okay. Well, I, I think. It might be wrong. I st <laughs> is that the only question you had, Taurus? <laughs> 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 Gouage. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, that can change, but that's easy. Now, the, the problem with this still is that um, the resources in uh, OpenNMS are defined using a string, but really that string needs to be split out into more usable uh, forms in order to be able to do a more useful search in Cassandra. And so what I've been looking at, and I haven't got any of that demonstrated here, is that there's an indexing plugin for Cassandra that's based on Lucene, which is basically the same stuff that Elasticsearch uses. And it allows you to specify a field and say, I want to index in that field. And that enables you then to end up with some indexes that you could actually search on to actually say, okay, I want all the time series data within this time range for this value from these nodes that fall within this, this set of categories. So it's a bit more work to do there to work out how to do that properly, but that's the next step. But even as it stands, as long as you know what the resource ID is, and you can basically work this out from the database information that we got saw previously here, you can actually do a search. Now, the really clever thing is this works standalone, but the processes that you define in this workbench can also be pushed down to Spark, and Spark can run against Cassandra. So if you have a truly big data example of this, you can actually create a process or a set of processes in the tool, push them down to Spark, and it'll run against all the nodes in your Cassandra database and do a map reduce to bring the data back. So that's extremely clever, and it comes for free as long as we just get the naming and the indexing right. So that's all I had to say about this at the moment. Thank you very much. Any questions? David? Yeah, that's right. I mean, ideally, it would be there'd be a switch on newts that would allow it to save data in a more usable form. In line, uh, in line yeah, not as a not as a um, not as a blob, basically. Uh, there might be other things that could be done on newts to just make life a little bit easier in terms of what's going into Cassandra, but you know, we'll we'll learn that as we go along. Um, but yeah, but it's a relatively simple stored procedure you stick in just to make the translation. In, in Cassandra 4, they promise to have indexes that can use functions. So uh, if and when Cassandra 4 comes out, it should be possible to attach 
that function to uh, or a function to an index and that could actually do all of this splitting clever stuff to actually split it into several different indexes in Cassandra but that doesn't exist at the moment Jesse yeah they're not there's no cost really to them so Yeah, and there may be other useful functions we could do. I think there probably might be a useful function we could do just to do some splitting of this and as well. Okay, well, we can talk about that later. So just for the type, Jesse... Uh, said that there is a level of indexing that I haven't exposed here that uh, already exists in Newt's that we could look at using. Um, we'll just have to see how that will work with the tool. But any other questions? David. So the the the. It was always the intention that the remote plugin could ask on a scheduled basis for uh, a set of things to download and run. It just wasn't implemented. So now it's been implemented, basically. And the other enhancement is that the licenses can contain secret data that couldn't it couldn't do before. Anybody else? Thank you very much.